This video is highlighting some of what Sam Harris has said in the past on his Substack. Uh, he's talking about the comments of Trump uh, after the Unite the Right rally, and he's talking about how the narrative wasn't completely accurate. Even though Sam's been very critical of Trump, I thought this was an interesting thing for him to say. These are the thoughts of Sam Harris from his Substack. He shares a few of his reflections on Trump. I think it is important to note that Sam has been accused of having Trump derangement syndrome by Trump's most rabid followers. We should ask if Trump derangement syndrome is really just a deflection that is used by Trump's followers to try to make any criticism seem unreasonable. Lie that will not die. Few writers or podcasters have criticized former President Trump more aggressively than I have. I've attacked the man in all the usual ways and in ways that many people find perplexing. I have even compared him unfavorably to Osama bin Laden for reasons that require more than a few sentences to explain. In response to the controversy over Hunter Biden's laptop, I said that, given what I think of Trump, I wouldn't have cared if Hunter had the corpses of children in his basement in those final weeks of the 2020 campaign, which made me the main character on right-wing Twitter X for several days. While many of the things I've said about the former president may appear extreme, I have never said anything about him that I believe to be untrue, and I frequently defend him against the false charges of others. Let's pause for a moment and ask why Sam would say this about Hunter's laptop. 1. Was Hunter actually running for president? If this had hypothetically been true, could have Joe have done anything to prevent this? Now that Joe is more removed from the political future, it should seem clear that the right-wing attempt to link Joe and Hunter is absurd. Two, there are many October surprises that happen right before elections that can have a large impact on an election. It can take a long time to verify claims. I do not think that former President Trump is Orange Hitler, but I have little doubt that he and his conspiracy-addled cult pose a threat to our system of government and to many of our most important institutions. The spectacle of a sitting president refusing to commit to a peaceful transfer of power, culminating in an attack on the Capitol, remains the most shocking violation of political norms to occur in my lifetime and the fact that some Republicans in Congress declined to impeach President Trump because they feared that they or members of their families might be murdered if they did, reveals how deeply Republican politics have been corrupted already. Let's note that there shouldn't be anything controversial about this statement from Sam, especially after January 6th in the revelations with the fake elector scheme. The burden of proof at this point should lie on anyone claiming Trump isn't a threat to democracy. However, as bad as Trump and Trumpism are, at least one of the most widely believed and damaging criticisms of the former president is based on a lie. I am referring to the allegation that, in the aftermath of the infamous Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, President Trump came to the defense of white supremacists and neo-Nazis, declaring that there were very fine people on both sides. I know from direct experience how harmful malicious quotation can be to a person's reputation. In fact, many of my statements about Trump are routinely taken out of context to make me look crazy or unprincipled, and even culpable for the recent attempt on his life. I have been off Twitter X for nearly two years, and yet Elon Musk still responds to, and thereby amplifies posts that deliberately misrepresent my views. This is just a special case of a nearly ubiquitous problem. Most people have neither the time nor the inclination to understand what their political opponents say in context. Rather, they are content to hold them accountable for the worst interpretation of their words that seems semantically possible. Many of the figures we despise for the terrible things they've said did not actually say those things in context. Let's just note that Elon is ridiculous for doing this to Sam. Elon is reckless and uncareful. History will prove Sam is better than Elon. Of course, the people who produce misleading clips know exactly what they are doing. To understand what a person meant in context and to then make it seem as though they meant something else entirely amounts to a conscious act of defamation. And of all the ways of attacking a person's reputation, it may be the most damaging because when done correctly, the resulting half-truth can be nearly impossible to debunk. Even when the target clarifies their original statement, 
lazy readers or listeners will be left wondering what all the fuss is about. What could be wrong with accurately quoting a person's words and drawing the obvious implications? All quotations are, by definition, selections from a longer text or utterance. Just how much context can a critic be expected to include without being castigated for quoting in bad faith? And in any case, where there's smoke, there's usually fire. We should ask ourselves if this is what often happens to Trump. Sometimes his words taken in context anger his supporters, so they lash out and accuse people Trump derangement syndrome. I have often used the following cartoon example to clarify the point. Imagine that I had once spoken or written the following sentences. Black people are apes. White people are apes. We are all apes. Racism doesn't make any sense. The problem for anyone who writes or speaks on controversial topics these days is that the Internet is filled with unscrupulous people who will not hesitate to reduce the above to the following meme. Black people are apes, Sam Harris. In response to the press conference he gave in the aftermath of the violence in Charlottesville, President Trump was attacked as a supporter of neo-Nazis and white supremacists for having said that there were very fine people on both sides. Two days later, in an article for The Atlantic, titled, We Are Living Through a Battle for the Soul of This Nation, soon-to-be candidate Biden wrote, Today we have an American president who has publicly proclaimed a moral equivalency between neo-Nazis and Klansmen and those who would oppose their venom and hate. We have an American president who has emboldened white supremacists with messages of comfort and support. And in a later campaign video, candidate Joe Biden claimed Trump's open endorsement of racism had inspired him to run for the presidency. With those words, the President of the United States assigned a moral equivalence between those spreading hate and those with the courage to stand against it. And in that moment, I knew that the threat to this nation was unlike any that I had seen in my lifetime. The claim that Trump praised white supremacists and neo-Nazis as very fine people has been repeated so many times in the media and in democratic politics that almost no one left of center understands the charge to be false. Judge for yourself whether very fine people on both sides is a fair summary of President Trump's remarks on that day. Here are the relevant sections of the transcript from his press conference. I have put the most important sentences in bold. Reporter, do you think that what you call the alt-left is the same as neo-Nazis? Trump, those people, all of those people, excuse me, I've condemned neo-Nazis. I've condemned many different groups. But not all of those people were neo-Nazis, believe me. Not all of those people were white supremacists by any stretch. Those people were also there because they wanted to protest the taking down of a statue of Robert E. Lee. Reporter Mr. President, are you putting what you're calling the alt-left and white supremacists on the same moral plane? Trump, I'm not putting anybody on a moral plane. What I'm saying is this. You had a group on one side and you had a group on the other, and they came at each other with clubs, and it was vicious, and it was horrible, and it was a horrible thing to watch. But there is another side. There was a group on this side. You can call them the left. You just called them the left, that came violently attacking the other group. So you can say what you want, but that's the way it is. Reporter. Inaudible. Both sides, sir. You said there was hatred. There was violence on both sides. Are the... Trump. Yes, I think there's blame on both sides. If you look at both sides, I think there's blame on both sides. And I have no doubt about it and you don't have any doubt about it either. And if you reported it accurately, you would say, Reporter, the neo-Nazis started this. They showed up in Charlottesville to protest. Trump, excuse me, excuse me. They didn't put themselves. And you had some very bad people in that group. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. You had people in that group. 
Excuse me. Excuse me. I saw the same pictures as you did. You had people in that group that were there to protest the taking down of, to them, a very, very important statue, and the renaming of a park from Robert E. Lee to another name. Reporter. George Washington and Robert E. Lee are not the same. Trump. George Washington was a slave owner. Was George Washington a slave owner? So will George Washington now lose his status? Are we going to take down, excuse me, are we going to take down statues to George Washington? How about Thomas Jefferson? What do you think of Thomas Jefferson? You like him? Reporter. I do love Thomas Jefferson. Trump. Okay, good. Are we going to take down the statue? Because he was a major slave owner. Now, are we going to take down his statue? So you know what? It's fine. You're changing history. You're changing culture. And you had people, and I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists, because they should be condemned totally. But you had many people in that group other than neo-Nazis and white nationalists. Okay? And the press has treated them absolutely unfairly. Now, in the other group also, you had some fine people, but you also had troublemakers, and you see them come with the black outfits and with the helmets and with the baseball bats. You had a lot of bad people in the other group. Reporter. Sir, I just didn't understand what you were saying. You were saying the press has treated white nationalists unfairly. I just don't understand what you were saying. Trump. No, no. There were people in that rally, and I looked the night before. If you look, there were people protesting very quietly the taking down of the statue of Robert E. Lee. I'm sure in that group there were some bad ones. The following day it looked like they had some rough bad people. Neo-Nazis, white nationalists, whatever you want to call them. But you had a lot of people in that group that were there to innocently protest and very legally protest. Because, I don't know if you know, they had a permit. The other group didn't have a permit, so I only tell you this. There are two sides to a story. I thought what took place was a horrible moment for our country, a horrible moment. But there are two sides to the country. President Trump generally does not speak well and often tumbles into incoherence, but his meaning in the above exchange was clear. Right or wrong, he believed that there had been many ordinary protesters in Charlottesville demonstrating peacefully on both sides of a polarizing issue, the fate of Confederate war memorials and other historical statues. In addition, he also believed, I think correctly, that there were bad actors on both sides of the ensuing conflict, the neo-Nazis and other white supremacists whom the media focused on, as well as Antifa and other left-wing groups that contributed to the violence. President Trump supported the peaceful protesters and decried the violent on both sides, and it is simply dishonest to say that his remarks in any way condoned racists or white nationalists. Rather, he said, they should be condemned totally. Notwithstanding that fact that there are credible accusations of racism against former President Trump, unfortunately the most credible I know of remain private, and that he often appears to dog-whistle to, or accept support from, the lunatic fringe on the far right, the very fine people on both sides charge is simply false. And yet, it continues to resurface in the pages of the New York Times and other mainstream publications, and in both the prepared and extemporaneous remarks of Democrats. It would be refreshingly ethical, and also politically wise, for Vice President Harris to retire this calumny once and for all. Do we agree with Sam here? Was he being fair to Trump? We have watched the waves of conflicting emotion undulate for two weeks now. Fear, patience, recrimination, compassion. I can't recall a political storm quite like this one. But there is an outside set rolling in, clearly visible against a darkening sky. Very soon, contempt will be all that anyone feels for President Biden and his circle of advisors.
No need to search the man's biography to discover the seeds of his self-absorption, because the mighty tree now stands before us. It is all about him. He wants, he needs, he can. One wonders which lunatic in his inner circle convinced the president that his personal story matters to anyone. Joe, they've been counting you out all your life. Stay the course. You'll show them. Satan, if he existed, could do no better than to whisper such blandishments into the old man's ear. There might be still time for President Biden to resign his campaign with dignity, but he is already a cautionary tale. So is his wife, Jill, and so are the people they trust most in this world. There is more than enough opprobrium to go around. Of course, most of us will never carry such responsibilities as the Bidens have, nor would we want to. So it is hard to know how one would behave under such a dangerous load. But my first thought upon seeing Biden unravel at the debate was, there is no way that Annika would let me go out on stage if she thought I might perform like that. This was a consoling thought. And looking in the mirror today, I know that I would never respond to such a failure with insouciance and bravado and glib dismissals of the obvious, unless I had brain damage, which, of course, may be the point. But what is the excuse of Biden's team? They are not merely courting disaster now. They are having tantric sex with it. By Monday, we'll all want their names so that we can know who should never work in politics again. Do you agree with Sam? Do you believe that Trump's following is in many ways cult-like? A's cult-like. A's cult-like.